John chapter 8, and once you found that passage, look with me, if you would please, at verse 12. John chapter 8, cast your eyes at verse 12. Again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the dark should have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you are bearing witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I am come from and where I am going, but you do not know where I am come from or where I am going. You people judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone, but but even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone in it. But I say, he who sent me, even in your law, it has been written, that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. And so they were saying to him, where is your Father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would, you would know my Father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. May the Lord be blessed be upon his word. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word, for the interest of your word that gives life. And now we pray that you would speak to us, that we might behold glorious truth from your law, and that that truth would find fertile ground in our hearts, our minds, souls, and our spirits to the intent that it will cause us to grow spiritually and draw close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We want to continue our series this morning on the I Am Statements of Jesus. And in the, the Gospels, Jesus makes seven profound statements in which he says, I am. Last two weeks, we looked in John chapter 6, where Jesus makes the profound statement to be the bread of life. He says, I am the bread of life. And he told the multitude, your father did eat the manna in the wilderness, and they're now 
am dead. I am the true bread, the living bread that came down out of heaven. That if men eat of that bread, they will never die. In John chapter 8, Jesus makes this second profound I am statement. When he says, I am the light of the world, in John 8, verse 12. As I shared with you in previous weeks, when he makes these statements, the Jewish audience interprets the statement to mean that he's making himself equal with God, that he is making a claim to deity. Because the reference of I am would have immediately referred them back to Exodus 3, when God revealed his name to Moses, and he told Moses to tell Pharaoh that I am sent you, that Yahweh sent you. The I am, the self-existent, self-sufficient, eternal God that does not have origin or beginning. The one who is from vanishing point to vanishing point, from infinity to infinity, the great I am. And so when they heard Jesus say, I am the bread of life, and then said that the bread that they, the fathers had eaten in the wilderness did not come from Moses but from his father, and then to say that he was the true bread, and now on this second occasion he says, I am the light of the world. Now, for those of you who are Bible scholars, you know that the context and the timing of a text is of critical importance. This particular text takes place during the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles took place around about the month of October. And during the Feast of Tabernacles, the Jews were commemorating the wilderness wandering of their fathers. And you remember from the Old Testament, the book of Exodus and the book of Numbers, that God led them out of Egyptian bondage under the leadership of Moses. They came out through the Red Sea into the wilderness. They refused to go into the Promised Land. They feared fighting the giants. Therefore, God judged them. And their ancestors had wandered in the wilderness at a place called Cadiz Barnea for 40 years. During the 40 years of wilderness wandering, however, even though they were in a state of rebellion, God had provided for them. He provided food for them and water for them. They had wanted 40 years and their shoes did not wear out. They must have had a pickway somewhere in the wilderness. But God had provided for them. He had sustained them during that period of time. And they tabernacled. They would pitch tents in the wilderness. And God led them by a pillar of cloud, a cloud that would move during, uh, in the sky during the day. And then when the night would come, the pillar of cloud would be re replaced with a pillar of fire, Amen. a fire cloud in the sky. And when it was time for them to stop and pitch tent, the pillar of fire would stop. And they would know that that's where they were to pitch the tent. So the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night was their guide. It was their compass directing them. And so the Jews would commemorate this, that during the Feast of Tabernacles, for, for seven days, they would pitch tents, and they would live outside to commemorate their ancestors dwelling in the wilderness in tents. And at the night during the Feast of Tabernacles, in the court of women in the temple, they would light the candelabra. And the candelabra was this huge chandelier with all these candles on it. And they would light the candelabra and they would raise it up and the candelabra would illumine the temple and the lighted temple could be seen from miles because Jerusalem is up on the hill. Uh -huh. And so the lighted temple could, could be seen from miles away and they were reminding themselves that God had led them by the pillar of cloud and by the pillar of fire. So with that as a backdrop, Jesus steps into the temple when they're preparing to light the candelabra with the stage having been set, and he says, I am the light of the world. I am the true light of the world. The cloud by day and the fire by night was nothing more than a symbol. It was a type. It was a predictor that God would one day send the true light into the world. And so with that as the backdrop and the statement now having been made, you can imagine the Jews scurrying, responding to the statement made 
by Jesus. But before we look specifically at their response, turn back with me in John chapter 1. This whole idea that Jesus is the light of the world and that people should come to this light. The Bible is replete with references to this thing. In John 1, John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And John is referring to here to the Lagos, the, the eternal Word. That Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Verse 3, All things came into being by him, and apart from him was nothing came into being that come into being. In him was life, and the light was the light of of men, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now stop right there. John, in John 1, he says that in the word was light, and the word that John used there for light is the word zoe, and zoe refers to the inextinguishable, indestructible quality that is self-existent with God. The zoe, the light that is in God, is inextinguishable. The light that is within God is indestructible. It is one of the intrinsic, eternal perfections of God. He says, in him was life. All of life has its origin with God. God is life. And so John says, in Christ, is the inextinguishable, indestructible, eternal life of God. That's why when a person receives Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they receive eternal life. Because to receive Christ into your heart by faith is to receive the very life of God. It is to receive the inextinguishable, indestructible, eternal life of God. That's why eternal life is not something that Christians get after a while down by the chilly Jordan waters. Eternal life is a present possession. It is a present reality that we have. The very life of God is inside of us. We can never cease to live. Even though, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, though this earthly tabernacle, Paul used the same word, this earthly tent is dissolved, Paul says, if this earthly tent literally falls down, he says, I have another tent. It's eternal, not made with hands. It's in heaven with God. So Paul says, I am inside this earthly tent, this earthly tabernacle. And he says, I'm yearning, I long to be clothed with my eternal tabernacle. But he says, just because this earthly tent falls down, because this earthly tent dies, it does not mean that I cease to exist. Paul says, well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Eternal life is a present possession and a present reality in the life of every person that's received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Because in him is life. And so John says, in him was life, the Zoe. And the life was the light of men. So John said that the life of God is the light of men, and the life of God lightens every man. In other words, the life of God, it illuminates. Amen. The life of God that brings light to men and that lightens men and women, boys and girls, it illuminates and it gives light. And so because Jesus is the light, and when we receive him by faith, we receive the life of God, then our lives then are illuminated. They are illuminated by the very life of God, with the light of God, and with the power of God. And so we have been enlightened by him. But look at what else John says. Not only does the light illuminate, it lightens every man. But John in verse 5 says, and the light shines into darkness. The light shines into dark places. And the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, that translation there of comprehended um, is, is a difficult word. But what John is saying is that the light illuminates men, and the light also dispels darkness. And when he says the darkness could not comprehend it, it is the darkness could not 
snuff it out. The darkness cannot extinguish the light. The darkness, once, if you are in a dark room that is pitch black and dark, and if you light just one match, it's no longer pitch dark. Because that one match, it illumines, it elucidates, that one match now creates light. And so John says that the darkness cannot extinguish, it cannot snuff out the light. That's why Jesus in Matthew 16, when he says, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. The authorities of hell, the powers of hell, the demons of darkness cannot extinguish the light that God has established in the church. As a matter of fact, when the church is on its offensive mode, when it's preaching the gospel, when it's evangelizing and calling men and women to repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, the church puts darkness on notice and darkness has to flee. So John says that Jesus, in him is light, and that light illuminates men, it lightens men and women and boys and girls, and that light dispels the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend. So it illuminates, it dispels darkness, and look at what else John says it does. Verse 6, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. Now John the Revelator, now we're talking about John the Baptist who baptized Jesus. So the Revelator says, John the Baptist came, and he came for a witness. That he might bear witness of the light, that all might believe through him, he was not the light, but came that he may bear witness of the light. There was a true light which came into the world that enlightens every man. That's a whole lot of light in that paragraph. Amen. So John the Revelator, the apostle, says about John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. John says that John the Baptist wasn't the light. A lot of people thought he was the light. A lot of people thought that John the Baptist was the Christ, was the Messiah. But John the Revelator says, no, he wasn't the light. He said, because John believed in the light, John's light was enlightened by the light, and so John became a smaller light to direct people to the true light. Amen. So the light of God illumines our lives so that we can be witnesses like John the Baptist. Amen. So that we can be witnesses unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you going to help me up Amen. When Jesus was preparing to ascend back to his father in Acts 1, verse 8. He says, and ye shall receive power, ye shall receive dunamis, after which the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses, moderates, those who testify unto death, ye shall be witnesses unto me. And then he says, both at home, Jerusalem, your neighborhood, Judea, to your enemies, the Samarians, and even the other parts of the earth. And so the life of God that lightens our lives and illuminates our lives so that we can be witnesses unto him. And so if you do not maintain as an ongoing vigil of your life to be a witness unto the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are failing to fulfill the reason that God illumined your life. God does not give us illumination just so that we can talk about how we are shining. He gives us illumination in our lives, in the terms of spiritual power, in the terms of a life that has been transformed, habits that have been broken, dysfunction that has been corrected, not so we can brag about it, but so that we can testify to the power of God and the good hand of God to put together those broken pieces of our lives. Can I get some help with this? And so that's why Jesus said, you might want to write the reference to that in Mark and Matthew chapter 5. When Jesus said to his disciples, and he's saying also to us, he told them in Matthew 5, 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. Now in Palestine that day, salt was used as a preservative. They didn't have the sophisticated refrigeration systems like we have. And so the fishermen would go to the market and they would catch their fish. They would salt them down to preserve them until they could get them to the marketplace. If they were to slay lamb stock, livestock, they would salt it down to preserve it because the salt, it 
retards decay. It retards future fashion. And some of y'all who grew up in parts of the country, like myself, know that every fall, the fall of the year, just before the weather gets real cold, is when you slay the hogs. And so when you slay the hogs and you have those big hams, you, you put curing salt on them. And you hang them in a room. And you salt them there with curing salt so that it would cure properly but not decay. And so the future fashion doesn't set in. So Jesus says that you, believers, you are the salt of the earth. You, Christians, you are the preservative that I have left on the earth to keep the earth from spoiling, to slow down and retard the, 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 the decaying process. You become the salt. And he goes on to say, when salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? When a salt loses its saltiness, you cannot make it salty again, he says. It's no longer good for nothing but to be thrown out and to be trampled under the foot of men. So in early ancient Palestine, they would have salt. When the salt went bad, they would then take the salt and they would use it to fill the potholes in the road. It was therefore trampled under the feet of men. It was no longer useful for its original purpose and intent. That was to slow down the decaying process and putrefaction and to give flavor and taste and zest to food. Are you following? So he says to his disciples, he says to us, you are the salt of the earth. You and you alone are the salt of the earth, and there isn't any other salt besides you. Amen. And so our role as the church, we ought to be the salt of the earth. We're not the salt of the church. We're the salt of the earth. When we come together in the sanctified confines of the church house, within the sanctified, consecrated walls when we pray and we testify, most of us in here are believers. And so we, our lives ought to be salty. And so we sing salty songs and we pray salty prayers and we listen to salty sermons so that we can become more salty. But what God wants the salt to do is salt is of no benefit as long as it's in the salt shaker. So what he wants to do is to take the salt from the shaker of the church, he then sprinkles the salt over here at the University of Charleston, sprinkles the salt over here at Dow, sprinkles the salt down here at the Kanawha County Public School System, sprinkles the salt over here at the Public Affairs and Military Safety, sprinkles the salt at businesses and communities so that the salt is everywhere. The salt now has been sprinkled everywhere, it can now permeate and influence wherever it is. Are you helping? That's our role as a church. We are to permeate, we are to influence, we are to give a salty taste to every field of human endeavor. Now, I know none of you know anything about happy hour. I've heard. My family and I stayed at the Embassy Suites not too long ago. And at the Embassy Suites, they have happy hour. I was amazed. It was almost as if someone had raised the dead. At about 4.35 o'clock, the, the lobby was literally packed with folk. And I said to the lady at the front counter, what's going on here? Is there a celebrity in the house or something? She said, no, it's happy hour. <laughs> Free drinks for everybody. So everybody gathered around for happy hour. So I watched them during the happy hour. People were patient. They waited in line, faithfully to get their drink. But then after the happy hour was over, they replenished the peanuts and the pretzels and the potato chip and popcorn was still free. Anything that you wanted with salt on it was free. Because once they'd given them a few drinks during the happy hour, they kept on giving them that salty tasting stuff. Then they would keep on buying drinks to try to satisfy the thirst that was created by the salt. Are you going to help me? God sprinkles us out into the society. He sprinkles us there so that we will have testimonies there. We give flavor. We give zest. We create a thirst that people want to know. How is it that we go through such difficulty and we don't have nervous breakdowns? How is it that we go through the pain and agony of our children breaking our hearts and we don't quit and give up? And so living out our faith in this public venue for everybody to see. God uses us to arouse the thirst inside of them so that they might be drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. They might be drawn to this fountain, this well of living water that springs up, that gives eternal life, and that satisfies the longings of the soul and the disappointed heart. 
Now, he said that you're the salt of the earth. But he went on to say, you are the light of the world. He didn't say that you are the light of the church. He said that you are the light of the world. And the text in the Greek is that you are the only light that the world has. There is, in, there is not any other light other than the church. We are the light. And so if just as the Lord Jesus illuminates and elucidates, and just as the Lord Jesus dispels darkness, as the church, we are to be the light, like a city up on a hill that cannot be extinguished, and that cannot be destroyed. And we alone, so the world might see, and we're like a lighthouse in the midst of the tempestuous, turbulent seas. And as people are trying to navigate themselves across the turbulent waters in this place that we call life, where husbands leave wives and where wives leave husbands, where children get pregnant out of wedlock and where children get addicted to drugs and people find their lives being crushed and having the waves of this life crash up against them. The church is to be a lighthouse in the midst of the storm, the oasis in the midst of a desert, a place that tired, weary, weary, parched souls can come and have their souls revived and refreshed by the living waters of the Lord Jesus Christ and to have their lives illumined by the light of Christ. Are you with me? So he says, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. No man light a lamp and put it under the pet measure but on the lampstand, Amen. and he gives light to all who are in the house. Mm -hmm. Let your light shine before men mm -hmm. in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen. So he says, you become the light because your life has been lighted by the light and the light of Christ. Mm -hmm. If the church ever captures, captures this concept, that it is our primary role and mission mm -hmm. is to bring glory to God Amen. through evangelism, mm -hmm. through soul winning, through, through bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ. That's why the church exists. Amen. Somewhere along the way, we took a wrong turn. Yeah. And we thought it was style shows and chicken dinners yeah. and concerts and musicals and special days of observance. Those things may or may not have their place, but the primary role of the church is to bring glory to God by bringing people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because he's worthy to be worshiped and he's worthy to be adored. And so the church ought not be satisfied until people are worshiping God. He's so worthy of worship that we want everything to have breath, praise in the Lord. And so we never lose sight of our primary mission to bring people to the light so their lives can be lightened and alone by the word. We'll turn back to John 8. So Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I'm greater than the cloud that led them in the wilderness. I'm greater than the pillar of fire that appeared at night to direct their paths and to set where they were to establish camp. He says, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me, the stop right there, light illuminates and dispels darkness and light gives direction. It gives direction. I've shared this with you before. I may not be to do it now. But in my pride, Brother Dan, I knew every curve on Deepwater Mountain. I drove it so many times back and forth to school. I knew every single curve. And my wife can testify this almost scared her to death one time to show her. See, I had to show off. So we were coming back, and I said, I bet you I can start on Deepwater Mountain and not put on brakes until I get to the bottom of the mountain. Because I know every curve on Deepwater Mountain. And I used to love to drive Deepwater Mountain at night because at nighttime, the whole road belongs to you. 
At nighttime, because you can anticipate through the headlights of the car that's coming from the other direction, so you can drive all over the road. And just to show off my Mario Andretti and AJ Ford skill, those are race car drivers out of the key. I would fly my 1972 Blue Duster from Mount Hope to Montgomery and back. Oh yeah, I could do it. I could do it in 35 minutes at night. I can make my time at night. Because I knew how much distance the headlights were up ahead, and I could anticipate the curve. And what I began to realize is that the headlight, it does not give me illumination from Montgomery to Mount Hope. It only gives me illumination for about 100 feet or so. So within that 100 feet, if I know where the next curve is, I can navigate myself around the next curve. So somebody will follow me. Somebody finds themselves on a dark road. And this bad and bad off mountain, y'all know that Logan County, y'all know how bad bad off mountain. If anyone was up in the Prince, West Virginia, you know how bad the Prince Mountain is to try to get from Mount Hope to Prince to catch the train. So somebody's on a dark road in the lights right now. And they cannot see the final destination. As a matter of fact, they don't even know what the destination is necessarily is going to be. But I just stopped by to tell you, Jesus Christ will illuminate just enough distance in the head of you. That by faith, don't try to go any faster than the illumination that he's given you. And he will give you enough illumination to allow you to maneuver yourself around the next curve. And don't worry about curve three. Take care of curve one first. He will give you enough light to maneuver around curve one. And he wants you to get around curve one. There will be enough light to deal with curve two. The problem with many of us you're trying to deal with every curve from Montgomery to Mount Hope at the same time. But headlights can't show you that far. And if by the grace of God, if God were to give you illumination, humanly, we can deal with it all at the same time. I've learned, I've learned through 45 years of existence and over 20 years of walking with Christ, I don't want to know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what one note tomorrow holds because if I know what tomorrow holds, then I'm going to be preoccupied with the day trying to change the events of tomorrow. So I miss the opportunity to serve God today. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. I don't understand his plan, but I can trust his hand. So I'm going to say sufficient enough is for me to deal with the issues and the circumstances of the day and to believe that he will give me enough illumination to walk today by faith. To trust him. And so he illuminates. He spells darkness and he, he'll give you direction. Somebody needs some direction up here. Someone is facing some perplexing situations and circumstances and you don't really know which way to turn. And there are many options and, and many choices and you don't know the right one to choose. You see, as we grow in grace, we begin to realize that we walk by faith and not by sight, because we're not smart enough to walk by sight. We, we're not smart to walk by sight. We're not omniscient. And so we don't know what's behind every door. We don't know what's on the other side of the curtain. And it's always easier to say, I could have done or I should have done once you see what's behind the curtain. But you've got to stop living in the past, because the choice that you make, if you make it by faith, trust in God and believe in God. And even though the circumstances and the situation on the other side may not be what you want them to be, but it might be a lot better off than what the other options were. You don't know what the situation might have been if you chose the other option. So just because things are difficult and things are hard, it doesn't mean that you didn't make the right choice if you made it by faith. And even if you made the wrong choice, if at that point you're surrendering yourself to the Lord, he's able to get you back on the right path. Because he's the light. And, 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 and he sees all tributaries and every other possible route to get you back on track. So sometimes you and I will make wrong turns and the Lord will have to allow us to have a, a scenic route that is wrong turns so we can just see what it's like when we choose to make choices without him. But when we repent and turn to him, he's already predetermined up here. I'm going to let him get back on the right road. So I can move them on down a little bit farther. Amen. Let me wrap this thing up. Not only does light illuminate, dispels darkness, and give directions, but it calms fears. 
it comes then. There's something about light. If you're in a dark room, it's amazing how you see stuff. Stuff is moving, and your heart starts to race. But just someone flipping the light switch and turning the light on, your blood pressure goes down. And your heart stops beating so fast when you realize that all those figures and images you thought you were seeing were nothing more than figments of your imagination, and the light brings a sense of calm. Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and I can bring calm and peace and divine tranquility to a troubled heart, to a perplexed life, to a confused mind. I can calm your fears. I can calm your fears. And so he says, and therefore, I am the light of the world. He who follows me should not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The indistinguishable, indestructible the quality that God possesses, we possess when we follow him. Well, I'm going to carry like John the Revelator and carry the believers that he wrote to in 1 John. When he says, walk in the light. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us and we got fellowship with God. See, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, because he's always in the light, and any time we step into the light, into the truth, we have fellowship with and as we fellowship with him, our souls are encouraged. Our spirits are revived. Our minds are put at peace. We are energized because he brings that fellowship to us. And he keeps on cleansing us from all sin and unrighteousness. You know, as I close, there's someone here this morning that's not in the light. You came close to the light. And when you come close to the light and the light starts to expose the sin in your life, you choose to pull away from the light. Jesus had something to say about that. Remember when he was meeting with the midnight rabbi, a man by the name of Nicodemus? And Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and wanted to know how could a man be saved? And Jesus said, you must be born again. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who so believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not judged, and he who believes not have been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And then Jesus said something interesting in John 3, 19. He says, and this is judgment, this is judgment, that light has come into the world. The light has come into the world. But he says, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. The light will expose our evil deeds. But if we come to it and confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and keep on cleansing us from all unrighteousness. He is the light. The only light that can illumine your life. The only light that can dispel the darkness that's in your life. The only light that can calm your fear. The only light that can give you direction. But his light is also his transcendent holiness. So his light exposes our sins. It exposes our sins for us to confess and to repent and to receive his forgiveness. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, we send you an opportunity to do that this morning. All you have to do is to agree with God. Yes, Lord, you're right. The light has exposed me. It's exposed the sin that's in my life. And I agree with you that it's sin. And I also understand that I cannot, I cannot take away my own sin. I cannot undo the sins that I have committed. And I realize the only way that that can be 
dealt with this through Jesus Christ. That he died on the cross for your sin and for mine. That he took the punishment that we deserve. And that he has made the full payment for our sins. And so if we turn to him and receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, then the punishment that we deserve has been placed upon him. And God forgives us, grants us a pardon. And the light of God lightens us, comes into us to give us the eternal life of God. That's what the Bible says. If you're here, if you need to be saved, you can come. If you're backslidden, or if you're just indifferent, today you'll allow the light of God to touch your life. Let's stand together. Let's bow before God. And if you need to do business with God, I would invite you.